There's a very small minority of dental offices nationwide that use a phase contrast microscope for analyzing samples of dental plaque. Here in our office, it's used every day by the doctors and hygienists alike, and we consider it an essential part of this practice. To get the most clinical value out of this procedure, it's important that there is consistency and uniformity of technique. And that's why this training video and other training aids are so important. Let's take a look at some of the supplies you'll need. Of course, you'll need microscope slides and cover slips. You'll need a uh, medium to uh, liquid to place the sample in on the slide and a slide sealer. There are a number of sources for these materials, but one easy one place source is Oratech. And on their website, oratech.net, you can order all of these supplies. You have to register first as a uh, licensed professional, then you have access to their professional supplies list. And of course, the phase microscope itself. It should be a setup that allows you to view through the eyepiece as well as through a uh, video feed to your monitor, which you and the patient can both see. So get very familiar with the microscope and all of its parts, all of the things that can be adjusted and all of the things that shouldn't be adjusted. I'll go over a few of them now. The eyepiece here, you have a binocular eyepiece. So these two can move up further apart or closer together depending on your interpupillary distance. So um, you'll need to work with these, uh, adjusting it for your own eyes. Please don't get frustrated if you're not that familiar with using this kind of a binocular eyepiece. It's really important that you practice and get used to being able to see easily through here um, to get the best use of, of your microscope and viewing your slides. These are the objective lenses. There's usually going to be more than one on your microscope. The one we're using is the 40X lens. If you have a 100X or others on here, we're not gonna be using those. They're not useful for what we're doing. So always, it's only the 40X lens. This is called the microscope stage. It's where the slide lays. There will be some kind of a uh, little clip um, that clips the slide in place when you uh, put it into position. The microscope stage is adjusted by knobs here that'll adjust uh, you know x and y axis so you can move the slide around and and scan through it as you want there will be a, a coarse and a fine um, focus most of the time unless you've moved the stage or done something that uh, dis disrupted the normal state of the microscope most of the time you're only going to be needing to use the fine adjustment but you'll use the coarse adjustment if something got um, really pulled out of place. There's going to be a place on your scope, and, and every scope is going to be a little different than this one. There will be a place to adjust the brightness of the light source. And there will be some little silver knobs um, that say phase one, phase two, that kind of thing. These are ones you should not adjust. Don't mess with those at all. Um, if these ever get out of balance or out of alignment, uh, it'll really mess up your view and you'll need to refer back to your microscope manual or better yet a microscope technician to come in and readjust this. And although it doesn't show well on this slide, somewhere, uh, well it may be this on this particular scope, but somewhere there's going to be a toggle switch that'll toggle between uh, viewing through the eyepiece or viewing through the video screen. For most scopes you can't do both at the same time, so you uh, flip back and forth. Some scopes you'll be able to visit uh, view th through um, both simultaneously. We're using Aura Prep as a mounting medium. It's specially designed for this as it's uh, isotonic to curricular fluid. In a pinch you can also use the patient's own saliva. With your slide and your cover slip ready, place a small drop of Aura Prep in the center of the slide. Use a curette similar to this type. Don't use a sickle scaler. It's too thin and too sharp, and it's easy to create bleeding, and it doesn't work as well to scoop up a plaque sample. Use the curette to gently reach to the bottom of the perio pocket and scoop up with a sample of the soft plaque. 
don't scrape up the side of the root like you're doing a scaling or root planing. If you get some calculus or other debris in the sample, it makes reading the slide more difficult. It's important to obtain a subgingival sample. A supragingival sample of plaque is not diagnostically useful. Consistency and uniformity in sample taking is important. We're looking for an area in the mouth that is likely to have the worst plaque. Since that's usually the posteriors, take your sample from a lower first or second molar. The mesiolingual corner is usually best. When do you take your plaque sample? You take it at the very beginning of the appointment. Take it before you do any irrigating, before you do any instrumenting. You want to know what the status of the patient is right now before anything has changed. You also should take it before you do any full mouth probing. If you have a uh, sample of uh, very active bacteria, like you'll see on some of the uh, photos later on here, you don't want to be inserting your perio probe into that very inflamed pocket and uh, risk pushing those bacteria or microorganisms into the delicate and breaking, easily breaking capillaries and into the bloodstream. So it can be somewhat dangerous to do perio probing in a very active pocket. You want to identify those situations first and then make sure that you are decontaminating that pocket, for example, with uh, irrigating before you do your full mouth probing. Tease your sample off of the curette and onto the drop of Oraprep with a uh, Explorer or Perio probe. It's good to take samples from at least two spots in the mouth. So if your first sample was from a lower molar, go back and take another sample from an upper molar. Tease this onto the same slide, onto the same drop. You can even stir them together a little bit. We're really looking at an aggregate picture of the plaque in the mouth and not trying to identify exactly where each sample came from. However, if you have already done perioprobing and you know that there's a particularly deep pocket somewhere, you might want to sample that separately. You can place it on a separate slide, or you may be able to place it on the same slide a little further away from your original sample, but this is a little trickier to do. Next, you're going to want to place the cover slip uh, in a way that avoids trapping air bubbles. So place the cover slip at kind of an angle to the slide, touch the slide and slide it until the edge just touches the edge of the medium, and then gently let it fall into place. And it's going to look something like this. If you place the cover slip carelessly, you're likely to trap a lot of uh, air bubbles and it makes it hard to read the slide. At this point, you should see some excess of liquid beyond the edges of the cover slip. You can press down on the cover slip and just to smear it around a little bit to flatten out the sample. You don't absolutely have to do this. Now you can take a two by two and press it down gently on the cover slip. This will kind of flatten out the sample and also blot any uh, excessive liquid beyond the borders of the cover slip. Here's an alternate way of blotting the slide. Place the slide on a folded paper towel. Once the cover slip has been placed, just flip it over, press it down, and that blots the excess liquid, flattens the slide, and gets it ready for applying sealer. At this point, the slide is going to look like this, and you'll be able to see the smudge of the plaque sample within the square of the cover slip. At this point, you could view it on the microscope, but it's important to seal it first. Sometimes after blotting, the cover slip might get a little skewed or crooked or you know, has slid uh, a little bit. Go ahead and just use your fingertip or whatever and kind of recenter the cover slip again on the main slide. We're using this product, Aura Seal from Aura Tech Company. It's very similar to clear nail polish, and in a pinch, you can use clear nail polish. It's just a little thicker and a little more difficult to use. Additional note about uh, sealants. When you first open the bottle of Aura Seal or other sealant, it's going to be pretty thin, which is good. That's what you want. After several uses, there can be some evaporation. Eventually, it's going to get a little more viscous and a little thicker. 
Once it gets too thick, don't throw it out. You can thin it out again with some acetone. So this is another product you should have on hand. Just add a couple of cc's or so and shake it up to kind of mix it together. And it should thin it out to a nice consistency. Add a little bit more if you need to, to get the desired thinness that you want. You can also use acetone on a two by two to clean up the dried sealant that will accumulate on the screw top threads on the bottle and on the bottle cap. Please do these steps in your vented lab or sterilization room so the patient does not smell or get affected by the fumes of the acetone. Carefully brush a thin layer of the Aura Seal on all four edges of the cover slip. You don't want to use too much so it doesn't, uh, you don't want to slop over uh, too much of the slide or slop over under to the underneath of the slide. So a thin amount like you're seeing in the picture here. It'll dry very quickly in half a minute or so. This seals the sample inside and it makes it quite stable for a couple hours or more. You may want to use a Sharpie pen and place the patient's initials on the slide for identification. If you don't seal the slide, it will begin to dry up and degrade after several minutes. So there are some very important reasons for sealing the slide. The sample will stay viable and won't dry up or uh, distort. And the sample is going to stay in a stable position. It won't drift around on the slide while you're viewing it, which can lead to some wrong slide interpretations, which we'll touch on later. You can view the slide right away, and it can be viewed again later in the appointment by you or another staff member. For example, the doctor may be coming into the hygiene room later in the appointment, and they can view the same sample quality and the same image. When you're ready to look at the slide, rather than just pushing it into place, first stop and rotate the 40x objective lens out of the way, and then slide the slide underneath there. Turn on your microscope light, and you'll see from below a little spotlight that helps you center the spot on the slide you may want to look at. Then go ahead and rotate the objective lens back into position. This helps avoid the possibility of damaging the lens with uh, any excess slide sealer or touching it or scratching it, basically just for the safety of the 40X lens. It is highly recommended that you get used to using the eyepiece to view the slide first. Use the video monitor screen to show the image to the patient afterwards. But using the eyepiece has the advantage of giving you a wider field of view for scanning the slide and usually a little better resolution than you'll see on the monitor. When you find a spot on the slide that you want to show the patient, then use the monitor. On some scopes, the image will be visible both ways at the same time. On others, you have to toggle between views. Usually you'll need a slight readjustment of focus and maybe even uh, brightness when you switch between views. And when you're ready to remove the slide, do the reverse. Rotate away the objective lens, slide the slide out. And again, this is just to preserve the integrity of the objective lens surface. And just another quick note, your microscope is likely to also have a 100 millimeter lens. We're not gonna use that. This lens is used uh, as an oil immersion lens and it really isn't useful for our purposes at all. So don't try and use the 100X lens, only the 40X. Now let's talk about reading and interpreting the slide. We're looking for the worst part of the slide. One slide sample may have parts where there's really nothing much going on, while other parts of the slide look full of bacteria. That's the spot where you want to view and score the slide. So here's what we're looking for on the slide. And these are the things you need to be able to identify. White blood cells, red blood cells, cocci bacteria, rod-shaped bacteria, and note if they're stationary or motile, in other words, highly moving. And by the way, if you didn't seal the slide, there's likely to be some drifting of the whole sample across the field of view, sort of like floating in a stream. And this can make it difficult to distinguish between motile and non-motile bacteria, one of the important reasons for sealing the slide. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so we're looking for also gliding rods. And again, are they gliding or are they drifting? If you've sealed the slide properly, they won't be drifting. And you can identify gliding rods. Um, spinning rods. Some spinning rods or gliding rods or motile rods look like what we call clock arms. There's a couple rods joined together that look like arms of a clock. Some people like to score this separately, or you can just include this under motile or spinning rods. Spirochetes, amoeba, yeast, and trichonomads, which are rather rare. And we'll get into each of these in more detail in a minute. Scoring the slide. So it's important to score the slide and record the findings in the patient chart so there's an objective finding to compare to on subsequent visits. This is why consistency of technique is so important. So you're comparing apples to apples. Score the worst part of the slide. Use the eyepiece to more easily find the spot you want to score where there's the heaviest concentration of bacterial activity but then use the monitor screen to do the scoring. You'll score how many organisms of a particular type are on the screen in a single field of view. Score as follows. A score of one means there are between one and 10 organisms visible on a single field of view. Two means 10 to 50 organisms. Three is greater than 50. And TNC means they're too numerous to count. It's important then to score and record the score in the chart. And it might look something like this in your chart write-up. Bacterial slide taken, one white blood cell, two spinning rods, one yeast, two spirochetes. You don't need to score zero for things that are not present. You can assume that if it's not on your score sheet here, it wasn't present. You may choose to alter this scoring system, but it's important that the whole office always uses the same system. So why score from the monitor rather than the, than the eyepiece? Well, it's because you're gonna get two very different scores. And again, it's a matter of consistency and not wanting to compare apples and oranges. On the monitor screen, you might, for example, see 10 or so spirochetes. But when you use the eyepiece, you have a much wider field of view, so you may see 50 spirochetes. You have to always be scoring the same field of view. And also the monitor is the view that your patient will see. So sco the scoring system is going to make more sense to them this way as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of some different plaque slides and see how we identify the different organisms. So let's look at our first sample here. And before I animate it, let's just point out what we're looking at. On the upper left here, this is just kind of the goo of the plaque. We don't pay much attention to that. We're looking at the clear spaces around it. We're going to see a number of these little dark dot shapes. These are cocci bacteria, fairly common to see in plaque and uh, fairly innocent. We don't consider these problematic bacteria. This slide has some other things that look kind of like fuzzy uh, lint or whatever. And it actually really is just debris on the slide, so we don't have to pay attention to that. On this slide also, you're gonna notice uh, this bright white dot with kind of a halo around it. This is just something that's out of focus on this phase contrast image. And if you go in and out of focus a little bit, this will show up, um, probably going to show up just as a cocci bacteria or it might be a piece of debris. But this kind of bright halo look is just something out of focus. So now the slide is in uh, real motion. So this is more what it really looks like when you look at a slide. There is life, there is motion. Um, the little dot shaped uh, cocci bacteria Although they're shimmer, shimmering around and seem to be in motion, um, they're really not motile bacteria. They don't move around on their own. The shimmering effect is more of what we call Brownian motion. So we don't consider those as motile bacteria. And as we scan around the slide, we see more of the uh, uh, dark dots and the white dots, which are just uh, cocci out of focus. So a fairly innocent looking slide with this would be considered to be from a, a, a fairly healthy looking pocket.
This next slide lets us see some other kinds of things uh, pretty clearly. Several white blood cells on this slide. This is a white blood cell. This and this. There's a little distortion on this white blood cell, which may have been from this slide drying out a little bit. When we set this in motion, you'll see the cytoplasmic granules inside the uh, cells, which looks kind of interesting. And then in the clear spaces, there's a lot of spirochetes you'll see, a lot of spinning rods, and uh, some of the typical kind of things we particularly look out for. There's also some red blood cells on this slide here. Here, they're starting to dry out and distort a little bit. But we'll go ahead and set this in motion next. Okay, now with this slide in motion, you'll see the kinds of things I was talking about, the movement of the cytoplasmic granules inside the white blood cells. You'll see the movement of these very motile bacteria, the spinning rods, the ones in the middle, they're kind of black uh, and look uh, like they're wiggling um, frantically. These are what we call spinning rods. And the thinner corkscrew shaped ones that are the spirochetes, they're also fairly wiggly and this highly motile slide is a typical of a, a fairly uh, active or diseased uh, periodontal pocket. Lots of spinning rods, lots of spirochetes. Okay, a few things to look at on this slide. We're going to see some uh, clumps of white blood cells. When we look at these in motion again, you'll see the activity inside the cells. By the way, the little dark um, circles inside the cell are the nuclei of the cells, of the white blood cells. On the lower left here, this large cell, and you'll see these sometimes, it's a large, flat-looking cell. Um, it's an epithelial cell. It's just a little piece of epithelium that kind of came off with the curette as the sample was taken. When I start the motion, I want you to look at this part of the slide, and you're going to see all these organisms drifting down, sort of like in a river. And when this happens, it's because the slide was not sealed, and it allows this drifting um, motion to take place, and it makes it hard to distinguish um, between motile and non-motile rods when you can't tell why are they in motion like this. You'll see in a second. So now here you can see what I mean on the left, this drifting of the slide due to the slide not being sealed. It makes it hard to distinguish uh, are these uh, bacteria motile, are they moving on their own, or are they just drifting with the current? So again, please be sure to seal your slides. And this slide is also showing a lot of activity of highly motile bacteria, spirochetes, spinning rods, a very infected uh, pocket, a very unhealthy periodontal situation. So on this sample, we're seeing a lot of the so-called goo of the slide, the bright blurry blob in the middle and on the sides. Um, this is just the thicker layers of, of the goo. It's too thick to be able to focus and see really what's going on. So we're looking in the clear spaces surrounding it. And in this, we're seeing mostly a lot of yeast. So all of the things that are the long stick-like figures that really aren't moving, um, that's yeast. And this slide is showing a higher level of yeast than you would expect to see on a normal slide. We'd probably score this slide at about a three on yeast. Looking closer, you can see uh, um, some um, spinning rods you may even be able to spot a uh, spirochete or two in there if it gets the right focus. But I wanted you to see what yeast looks like in a, in a good sample here. And it's common to see a few of these, but it's not common to see this many. And I would consider this a high level of yeast, and I would ask the patient about um, potential systemic yeast overgrowth issues. So here's a little bit more zoomed in view, but a good view of some uh, spirochetes. You can see the uh, high level of uh, activity of these wiggly spirochetes, a lot of spinning rods. This is a very highly active slide, a very uh, infected pocket. Upper left, you'll see some what look like sort of stacks of uh, sticks there. Those are yeast. The long in the middle of the field, the long 
more or less stationary sticks are also yeast. But pay particular attention to what all the uh, uh, highly active wiggly spirochetes and uh, spinning rods look like. I hope this will show a little bit more clearly graphically why you don't want to go into these pockets with instruments or not even with a perio probe because you're going to be shoving these nasty looking organisms right into the bloodstream and that can be problematic. So when you see a slide that looks like this, make sure you're doing um, de detoxifying of the pockets before you do any instrumenting or probing. And by that I mean subgingival irrigation or use of a laser or whatever your office protocol is for detoxifying pockets. And here again, a little bit more magnified view, uh, but a very clear view of two amoeba. This is what you're going to see amoeba look like. And uh, you can see inside the cell, you'll see the nucleus uh, and some other in inclusions there. But the rest of the cell is uh, this kind of darkish gray, clear color. And that's how you uh, easily distinguish this when you're looking and trying to distinguish between this and a white blood cell. And of course, you can see how this um, balloons out and bubbles out and changes its shape. Hallmark, uh, a typical appearance of, ye of um, amoeba. This is what uh, trichinomad is going to look like. They're pretty rare and you may not ever see them. But if you do, it's going to look something like this. Uh, that you'll see kind of a whipping action of a flagella at one or more ends of the um, organism. And it has kind of an erratic movement to it. But this is trichinomad. Please realize here that we're looking at um, general profiles. We're not identifying specific species of organisms. For example, we see lots of spirochetes, which are generally going to be treponema, but we're not trying to identify what the specific species is. Um, that can be done with something like oral DNA testing, and that can be very helpful. But that's not the purpose of this video or this technique. Let's talk about interpreting the slides diagnostically. Please be careful that any diagnostic interpretation comes only from the hygienist or the doctor. A chairside assistant might be the one who's preparing the slide or showing the patient, and sure, you can um, make some descriptive comments, but they should not offer any diagnostic interpretation. Maybe remarks like, oh, your slide is pretty quiet, or um, there's a lot of activity on this slide. That's fine, but diagnostic interpretation should be left to the doctor or hygienist. And this is just for medical legal reasons. In general, a more active slide, and that means one that has more motile organisms, equates with worse periodontal pocket infections. Motile organisms tend to be more pathogenic than non-motile organisms. Sometimes this is enough of an explanation for the patient, but they may want more detail, as do you. Amoeba. Amoeba may be hard to spot by some practitioners at first until you get some practice. Use the eyepiece view because it'll give you a wider field of view and you can scan the whole slide more quickly. Amoeba often go hand in hand with high spirochete score. So if you see a lot of spirochetes, look extra closely for amoeba. They may look similar in size and shape to white blood cells. The difference you'll spot at first is that they don't have the cytoplasmic granules that white blood cells have. Their interior is clear and will usually show up as kind of a darker gray. They'll usually be a, a little larger than a white blood cell, sometimes a lot larger. And they will also change shape and you'll see extensions ballooning out like a water balloon. So when you're scanning, look first for the darker, clearer cytoplasm. Stop on a suspicious looking area and wait a moment to see if it changes shape. That's usually gonna be the telltale. Some white blood cells can also exhibit this shape change as when they're engulfing something, but that's rarely seen on these slides. The difference will be that you'll see the cytoplasmic granules quite clearly on a white blood cell. If you know from the patient history of travel in the last few months or years to places like India, Southeast Asia, Mexico, Central or South America, or so-called third world countries, 
Be on the lookout for amoeba regardless of the pocket depths or other signs of periodontal inflammation. These parasites can often be seen in what would otherwise look like a healthy mouth, and you can do your patient a great service by spotting these. Without this use of a phase contrast microscope exam, the patient may never be aware that they have a parasitic infection that they brought back and that should be dealt with systemically. If you've been looking at lots of slides and lots of active slides and still have never seen an amoeba, you're probably not looking closely enough. You may want to get some help from a more experienced uh, staff member on spotting amoeba. Amoeba are a serious parasitic problem. They shouldn't be present in the mouth at all. You should assume that this also represents a parasitic infection in the gut. Patients should be referred to a good naturopathic physician or other integrative health practitioner who can help deal with uh, the problem systemically. They're fairly easy to eradicate orally, and usually your patient will be highly motivated to do so once they've seen their slide. This is a good point to mention one aspect of home technique. It's not the purpose of this video to get into treatment protocols, but I do want to mention the water pick. Anyone who has any kind of active slide should be including a water pick as part of their home routine. We know it to be very effective when it's used regularly and correctly, much less effective when it's used incorrectly, which is what most people do. So please refer these patients, whether they're already using a water pick or not, to our instructional video. This is very important. It's on YouTube and you can just use your favorite search engine to search water pick instruction, Dr. Paul Rubin. Next, let's talk a little more about spirochetes. The most obvious and most notorious periodontal pathogens are spirochetes. They tend to be the biggest red flag and the easiest ones to score for comparison purposes on subsequent visits. You can almost equate the higher the spirochete score, the more infected the pocket. And as mentioned before, when you see a lot of spirochete activity, always look more closely for amoeba. Another note about spirochetes, and this applies to some of the other organisms too, sometimes preparing the slide is kind of like a shock to the organisms, and they may sort of retreat under the goo of the slide. When you view the slide right away, um, it may give you a lower score. If you view it about 10 minutes or so later, the level of spirochetes may be a lot higher because they sort of migrate back out into the clear fields from beneath the goo. So it's a good idea to always recheck the slide several minutes after it's been prepared. If there's a high number of white blood cells on the slide, it's usually a sign of higher level of inflammation or infection. However, it might also be a result of getting too much supragingival plaque into the uh, slide sample but do consider it a warning sign. The inflammation might be periodontally triggered or it might be a systemic issue. A referral to a qualified naturopath or other physician might be advised, or the doctor here may be comfortable ordering some testing for inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and taking it from there. Red blood cells, there usually won't be uh, much red blood cells present unless the sample is taken a little too vigorously and you've created some bleeding or the pocket is so inflamed it just the gentle presence of the curette in the pocket is enough to create a lot of bleeding. So if there's profuse bleeding and a lot of red blood cells on the slide, it may be difficult to get a, an accurate score of microorganisms on that slide sample. Cocci are usually fairly innocent forms, and they're usually non-motile, except for a sort of shimmering in place uh, motion, which you'll notice, which is really a result of just Brownian motion. So we don't consider the presence of cocci to be uh, path patheno pathogenic particularly, um, but we do want to note their presence and their numbers. With rod-shaped bacteria, we're more concerned about are they stationary or are they motile rods. Motile rods take the form of gliding or spinning rods usually, and think in terms of the more motility means more trouble. You may see large rods that sort of glide across the screen slowly like a submarine, 
and others are usually smaller that may zip all over the place. Um, some are in more of a spinning motion, we'll call those spinning rods. Sometimes you'll see dense groups of very small rods that are uh, in fast motion and that almost looks like bees in a hive. There's an appearance called clock arms that you may or may not uh, decide to score separately. And these usually are just a couple of rods joined together and they look like arms of a clock. So we're most concerned about motile rods, uh, gliding and spinning rods. And again, the more of these that you see, the more troublesome the sample. Yeast, we already talked a little bit about when we looked at the slides. They're going to look like long sticks, stationary. Sometimes you'll see that they look sort of like budding branches. So when you see long um, stick-like thin rods that uh, are longer than the usual rod bacteria, these are probably going to be yeast. It's common and it's normal to see some yeast in plaque. But if you see a lot scoring like a two or three or more, that's not normal and you should uh, mention it to the patient. Ask if they've used any antibiotics in the last few weeks or even months that may have thrown their flora out of balance. Consider that they may have a systemic overgrowth or imbalance of yeast like candida and that a referral to a good uh, physician might be advised. Trichinomads, as I've said, are, are fairly rare to encounter. If you do see them, though, they're pretty dramatic looking. Generally, you're going to see them if there's a really uh, deep infected pocket in a really unhealthy mouth, lots of other stuff going on, and a rather unhealthy patient. The presence of trichinomads should be considered a sexually transmitted parasitic disease, and the patient should be aware of this and referred um, accordingly. Often patients are going to ask, where do these organisms come from? And a flippant though fairly accurate answer is mothers, lovers, and dogs. All of these organisms can be transmitted through intimate contact, including kissing between uh, partners, spouse, um, mothers to little babies, or uh, like this with uh, pets, dogs. Now, if you have a, a patient that you've been treating who's showing signs of improvement, and then on a subsequent visit, uh, the slide looks worse again, first consider if their home technique is adequate, but then also consider they may be getting reinfected by a partner or spouse. This uh, conversation may feel a little awkward, but sometimes you have to tell them that they're not going to get rid of their infection long term until or unless their spouse or partner is also appropriately treated. Also on stubborn cases, uh, assume there may be a systemic, not maybe, there is going to be a systemic uh, component that's not being addressed. And it's appropriate to refer them to uh, a qualified physician, maybe preferably a naturopathic physician, for systemic testing and treatment and support. That subject is beyond the scope of this video. So practice these steps. Practice making slides. Practice looking at a lot of slides. Also treat the microscope with great respect. It's an expensive instrument. If you find over time you're not able to get as sharp an image as before, or the lighting looks wrong, or the images somehow look different, it's likely that the lens may need cleaning, or that the adjustments on the diaphragm or the condenser or other parts of the scope may have accidentally gotten changed. Unless you are very familiar with your scope and all of its settings, you may need readjustment of your microscope by a technician. A qualified microscope technician should be visiting the office regularly to keep the scopes tuned properly and, and in good working order. And one last piece of microscope maintenance that you should be uh, familiar with is changing the light bulb. It's going to burn out at some point. You'll find a little compartment in probably towards the back of the scope. Every scope has a little different spot where the light bulb is kept. Um, but find out how to open that and access the light bulb know what kind of light bulb that you have uh, and where to get them and make sure that you have uh, extra spares on hand so that you don't have any downtime. And here if you want is where you would insert a joke of how many hygienists or dentists does it take to change a light bulb.
So that's it. Please be sure that everybody in the office who uses the microscope or takes plaque samples or prepares slides, even if you've been doing it for a long time, please make sure that everyone in the office has been trained with this video, please. Thanks.